Hello. Hello, I'm Hello. Karen Jenkins Johnson. Hi, you guys. Principal of Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco and New York. Thank you for joining us. My team and I hope that you're healthy, safe, and well during these very challenging times. We welcome you to our 12th Conversation on Culture, a weekly discussion during the COVID-19 pandemic with artists, curators, and collectors on current art world topics. On this first Friday of the summer of 2020, I'm happy to be in conversation with three of the four artists from my gallery's first virtual exhibition, Figurative Summer. Amani Lewis um, won't be able to join us today. We send out prayers to her and her family. Uh, Ludwig Knott, Raylis Vasquez, and Cameron Welch are here with us today. Ludovic Knott was born in Cameron, West Africa, Cameroon, West Africa. He migrated to the U.S. at the age of 13 to South Carolina. He has a BFA from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. A, he's a 2021 MFA candidate at Hunter College. Ludovic, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yay. Ludovic's work presents a complex but highly personal investigation of a very personalized view of Africa, his family history, and the cultures, traditions, and ideas of Africa and its diasporic pre- and post-colonialism. They are approached with a type of naive rush, rushness and immediacy and boldness of color that suggests both a passion and a sense of discovery. African symbols such as masks, patterns, and other symbols of identity and culture remain consistently throughout Ludovic's work. Raylis oh, Vasquez, thank you. you're welcome. We're happy to have you. Raylis Vasquez is a, a, from the Dominican Republic. He migrated to the U.S. in 2002. He has a, uh, he's an MFA candidate at Columbia University, and he holds a BFA in painting and drawing at, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Raylis draws on historical, political, and personal narratives to create figurative compositions that conjure the complexity of the Afro-Latinx experience. The figures in his paintings inhabit a state of vulnerability that often encourages the viewer to question their uh, positions on class, race, and geography. As an immigrant, he is committed to accurate representation of the histories of the Dominican Republic. Realist lives and works in New Jersey. Finally, Cameron Welch, uh, Indianapolis native, has a MFA from Columbia University and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's received one River Schools Emergency, um, Emerging Art Award. Cameron um, has a, um, investigates history and its resonance with contemporary life, collage elements of wall-mounted mosaic relic reliquaries, and rethinks the contemporary possibilities of the medium. He, he's examining painting and ready-made sculpture and tradition of craft to deconstruct fixed notions of race and memory. He considers both societal and personal history to protest master narratives of American history codified through language and action. Cameron lives and works in New York. We, he also participated last fall with uh, in Then and Now uh, at Jenkins Johnson Gallery, curated by Antoine Sargent, along with uh, uh, artist Chase Hall. There will be a Q&A at the end of the conversation, so please send us a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please also join in the chat. Hey, you guys, we welcome you today to our conversation on culture. How y'all feeling? Feeling good. Hey. Amani joined us as well. Oh, here. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Hi. Are you joining us from Baltimore? Yes, I am. I am here from Baltimore. Well, well, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, of course. Uh, Amani was born and raised in Columbus, um, Maryland, and she has a BFA from Maryland Institute College of the Arts in general fine arts and illustration. And as she says, she's from Baltimore. 
and she is a, or they, they are um, part of her, their objective is to be sure that the people in Baltimore are presented as people and not seen through the lens of outsiders looking in. As mm. this Imani's uh, objective with their work. So thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. So, you know, this is a very, uh, the times right now are, we're living in historical moments. Uh, being an emerging artist at this time um, is uh, uh, something that I'd like for you guys to just explain to, to co comment about, you know, again, what does it feel? How you feeling? How is it impacting your practice? Why don't we start with um, Ludovic? Yes, of course. Um, I would say <laughs> it's definitely strange times uh, and hard times as well. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I relocated to uh, South Carolina where I was making uh, a lot of the work from that time period. And it was a strange period because I wasn't used to creating in the specific pace, space that I was creating in. And also the pace that I was creating at was also new to me. So I would say the pandemic didn't really directly affect uh, my work, but it informed the way I create. And it also helped me slow down with a lot of uh, the techniques that I use while I'm creating. And I'm still healthy, so that's good too. <laughs> and you are heading out to a foreign country here, if possible. <laughs> yes. Is that possible? Are you, are they still um, crazy, crazy. Is this morning the flight was actually changed, so I'm actually flying out on Monday now. So. So you're going to be heading to Fingers Spain. Fingers crossed. Yes. Yes, this Monday coming up. Okay. And okay. Um, and what will you be doing over there? Uh, I'll be working on some projects coming up in the fall and uh, beginning of winter and also some fairs like uh, on Tidal and uh, 154 in London and a few other projects that I have coming up. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Rayless, how are yeah. you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, Love, no, the glasses. I Love the glasses. Yeah. No, I think for me, it's... Um, it's definitely affected my practice. I don't know if it's affected like the way my work looks um, at all, but I mean, I, we were kicked out of our school studio. So um, I've been working from home. We're working from my apartment, which, you know, kind of looks insane now because it's just work everywhere. Um, and yeah, with, with everything that's going on, it, it's just, it's a lot to process and a lot to think about. And, you know, I'm, I'm really, as like, as a state of mind, I was kind of like feeling like hopeless, but with mm -hmm. all this, that's, um, with all the activism that's happening with every people like really fighting, it's, it's really hopeful and it's really, um, I don't know, it, it's, it makes me feel like there will be, you know, a better, a better future. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's something that I kind of carry within and it is affected my practice in that way. And uh, Amani. Oh, Amani, by the way, send yes. you. Oh, uh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hi, y'all. Hey. Hey, Amani. Hey, um, yeah. Yeah. So the beginning of the pandemic was a very interesting start for me because I was doing my residency at Fountainhead at the time. Um, and then also at the right, at the same time, I found out that my partner had some issues that we had to take care of at the Duke Hospital. And so starting the pandemic off was mainly about taking care of my family and loved ones and like getting all that situated. So I couldn't even really focus too much on my art. But then also, also at around the same time, you know, all the things happening with the police brutality and the uprisings and the activism started to happen. Um, and you know, you guys, I'm from Baltimore. And so we had a similar situation happen in 2015, which was like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it really informed what I'm doing right now in terms of finding authentic stories to, to be sharing instead of what we're perpetuating in our media. And so right now, all I'm doing and all I'm feeling is like love to see how many people are coming together. It's like so crazy that protests happened all throughout the United States and in other countries. And the world. Yes. Exactly. So it's like this is definitely a time where people are saying enough is enough. And back then, I felt like it was my job to be up on these streets, marching and screaming. If y'all Google, y'all might find some protest pictures of me. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, <laughs> But I, I glad, I'm feeling glad that I can just focus on what's happening in my personal life and know that people are holding it down. So that's what I'm coming right now. Aaron? Uh, yeah, I would say like my practice was, uh, you know, pretty directly responsive uh, to everything that was going on. I found it really interesting to try and make a body of work um, in a time when you know, that's kind of unprecedented and, you know, at least extremely modern history. We all are stuck inside for so long. And I think so much of my work deals with, you know, um, sort of cultural identity and thinking about, you know, how we're all sort of operating um, within confined spaces, right? Uh, really impacted the nature of uh, sort of the imagery and the contextual sort of signifiers that are present in this uh, new body of work behind me. Um, it was just like also in terms of the, the resourcefulness of, you know, some of the things that I include in the work, you know, I couldn't, you know, readily go out and find things or, uh, you know, um, there were all of these sorts of limitations that turned out to be, a, you know, a really positive and generative force um, in the practice. And also with, you know, everything that's been going on um, in terms of you know, the police brutality and, you know, racial justice and all the sort of protests that have been happening and everyone sort of having a voice. Um, I would say that, you know, the work I've been making recently is sort of trying to gather some of the urgency behind, uh, you know, those issues. Um, so yeah, I would say it was, you know, directly impacted from what's been happening, for sure. So, you know, that said, the protesting was, wasn't just in the United States the protesting is around the world. And um, so that, that leads me to ask you, um, do you, do you guys see a global statement for black people? For brown oh, people? indeed. Oh, do you want me to expand on that? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, you know, when Trump got elected, it was like interesting that our political, what was happening in our political climate was like in the commentary of other countries. And I was just like, it's crazy to see all these people are having so much to say about how we running things over here. And I rarely know what's happening in Europe or Asia or Africa or anything. So I feel like I gotta do some more, some more social, uh, social studies. Um, but yeah, definitely. I feel like there's just a nice solidarity that's happening between all of us in the world for Black people. I think, especially in our country. And I wish I knew more about what was happening in other countries, just in terms of how Black people are feeling they are being treated in their climates or in their environments by other people. Um, so I can advocate just as much as they're advocating for me for them. Um, but yeah, just based on what I've been reading and watching, yeah, it's been nice. I mean, Berlin, London, and these are not just black people protesting. These are people from all races, uh, generations, um, demanding, demanding change and demanding exactly. an action on the part of, of um, the government and legislation. Um, Ludovic, you're from uh, West, you're originally from West Africa. You got the girls calling you? <laughs> yes, give me one second. Someone is <laughs> ringing on my door. I don't know who this is. Oh, God. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay, I thought I was the only one hearing it, but okay. Nah, we were all playing cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you mind asking your question again? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you're from, you're from um, 
from Cameroon, West Africa, and you came here when you were 13 and, uh, you know, going to South Carolina and uh, dealing with uh, um, issues down there. Uh, how do you see, because you deal a lot within your work or your friends and family and issues regarding the pre and post colonialism, how is this, mm -hmm. how do you see this uh, global statement uh, uh, happening with black people? I'm gonna ask all y'all, so. <laughs> You know, it's weird that, you know, I moved to South Carolina at the age of 13. And, you know, I think I was too focused on trying to be a child and fitting in that I wasn't really paying too much attention to uh, politics and the climate of everything other than, you know, my well-being. So now that I, after I moved to New York and I went back to visit South Carolina, I actually started noticing more of these uh racist things and other uh injustice that have been going on in the country more particularly the south so and then now with all this it's funny because now the whole world is actually getting to see some of the things that you know people of color and black people have been going through for many years you know and i was having this conversation with some friends and i was just telling them that you know nothing has changed it's just now these things are just being documented and televised you know it's it's the same thing that's been happening this whole time so now that everyone the whole world is coming as one to try to uh make a better world for you know people that are coming after us because i personally don't think this change is going to happen uh within my time or our time and you know these fights that we're fighting right now i believe is just for people coming after us well, systemic racism and, and runs deep, and it's not something you can yes. solve overnight. It's not something you can solve quickly and easy. Exactly. Else in uh, DC said, um, uh, it's definitely something that needs to be continually fought, and we need to fight it um, in the courts and through legislation, and we need to have these kinds of conversations. And Realist, you uh, came here from Dominican Republic, uh, and you have immigration um, 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 within your work. You have the, uh, you, you deal with immigration within your body of work. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Gladly. Um, yeah, I think immigration is, I, you never stop being immigrant. It's not something that, like after time, you know, um, kind of goes it's always at the front and center of how I see my experience. Like I went through that and there are certain um there's certain changes that happen. You know, I'm from Dominican Republic, I'm from El Campo, which is like the countryside. Um we were living with like barely any electricity, barely any running water. And then, you know, as a kid, I was seven years old when we immigrated. But um the next day you land to like New Brunswick, New Jersey into a whole new life. Um your family isn't around, your culture's not around, you don't know the language. So it's like, it's a complete disruption. And it's really interesting for me to see nations' attitudes towards immigrants, specifically mm -hmm. like the United States. Um, Cause we, we, kind of, we pick a target, we always pick a target when it comes to immigrants. In the US, oftentimes it's like Mexicans or um, Muslim immigrants. And in the Dominican Republic, it's usually Haitian immigrants, but you pick a nation and it always has its um, target towards an immigrant. And it was interesting for me, someone that's of African descent, um, coming as an immigrant um, from a Latinx community, Latinx background, where when I first came, it was like the Black American community was like, you're not Black, you can't even speak English, you know? And then like the, the Latino community was like, really, you're Latino? Like you're, you look Black. You know, so it was it was that kind of dichotomy that I was living in at the same time, like adding being an immigrant on top of that is something that kind of just complicates the narrative altogether. Um, so it's, thing, it's definitely things that I try to address. Um, and it's really beautiful to see how people are protesting, specifically in Dominican Republic, um, you know, acknowledging their blackness, acknowledging our blackness. It sounds like it, we've definitely come a long way, but it shows that this acknowledgement, like it shows how far behind we still are. 
the fact that now is that we're starting to like really acknowledge it, you know? Yeah, I, I, I when I thought about um, the summer, figurative summer, uh, we had the summer of 67, 68, and mm -hmm. now we have the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're still talking about this decades later. Um, I mean, it's, it's something that uh, the differences are, though, is that more people are out, white people are also speaking about this and seeing this. Um, and Cameron, you're from Indianapolis, and um, um, you are, uh, you might say, you are of mixed race, and uh, you uh, lived in Chicago for a while, and now you're in, in New York. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how um, uh, the black body, uh, the figurative element uh, features within your body of work, which is quite uh, different than um, the paintings of Ludovic and Reyes and uh, Amani? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, growing up, my, you know, my mother is white and, you know, my father's black and we, I lived in this neighborhood that was just like nestled right in between like an extremely affluent neighborhood and an extremely you know poor neighborhood and there you know in Indianapolis it's you know at least while I was growing up it still felt like slightly segregated by class and that there was a de very definitive north side and a very different south side and you know each group of people lived like where they were um, depending on you know uh, how much money they made. And I grew up right in between those two spaces and where I went to school was often divided the same way. And so I was always trying to navigate the sort of liminal space between identity and um, speaking in terms, and like living in Chicago, you know, you go to the South side, it's, you know, very different than when you're hanging out on a, like, you know, near the lakefront, for example. Right. Um, uh, and a similar conversation, like, uh, going to, you know, graduate school at Columbia, for example, and being in Harlem, but being also attached to this major institution that, you know, has a very conflicting history um, with the neighborhood at times. Uh, so taking all of that into account and thinking about um, you know, cultural narratives um, and, you know, various histories, uh, the Black body in my work operates uh, in terms of mainly, you know, proposing a new mythology for uh, black and brown people that, you know, at least in the majority of the mosaic, primarily mosaic work, uh, was about telling this story, you know, the supposed story of, a, a, you know, a culture or constructed culture that seems from, you know, long ago um, to sort of pose a new sort of set of power dynamics for uh, representation or ideas around representation uh, for, you know, black bodies. Imani, could you tell us a little bit about um, you? I'm, I, this is wonderful to have you four here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about collaboration, how you collaborate with uh, of your peers? I know Cameron has, has done some, uh, Ludovic and Rayless are, are friends. Um, you know, artists, we, we, and people in the art world, we love relationships. Uh, could, could you tell me how collaboration fits into your guys's um, mm. current work? And I'm going to start with Imani. Yeah, okay. So the main thing that I uh, was working with when it comes to my practice in Baltimore um, was like taking these false, these like perpetuated false narratives around Black people and how you're supposed to relate the black people in the city and I guess showcasing the people that I've had direct relationships to. And so I've been in Baltimore now for probably seven or eight years. Um, and I've met so many people just off the streets or in the store or just on the stoop, sitting on the stoop and just sat there and listened to them. And that's really all it takes. It's just someone like listening to what you have to say and you feeling like, 
your experiences as just like a human being matter. Um, and so I started making these pieces that was in reflection to who I was engaging with and thinking about the landscape of Baltimore and its agriculture and all these other things. Um, and then I started meeting artists. And so it was wonderful to like meet these artists that are in the art district, but also just from Baltimore and have this curiosity about like the art world or something. Um, and so my best friend, Marjani, we went to school together uh, at MICA. And she's someone who I like love dearly. And Joe, she's uh, from Boston. Um, we made this collective a few years ago called Colored Collective. And um, sorry, my screen changed. I got like scared, I got disconnected. We made this collective called Colored Collective. And what we were trying to do is like find black and brown folks who were here in Baltimore who were talking about their identity or having these conversations about identity um, in relation to their environment and then exposing their work and talking about their work uh, in a greater conversation. But we were very young at the time and there was a lot of things that needed to be considered that we will revisit now. Um, fortunately, I started working with Kilo Luckett. I think she's here. So shout out to you, Kilolo. Love you dearly. Um, she gave me my first institutional solo show at the August Wilson Cultural Center, African American Cultural Center um, in Pittsburgh. And she gave me the opportunity to do this idea, which was taking a solo show that included people who I like respected and loved and thought the world should also see. And so collaboration for me is like, well, just stepping back really quickly, thinking about the art world and what I've learned about the art world is that it's very exclusive. Like, you know somebody and even when you know somebody, it's hard to really get in. And then when you get in, you're like, fuck yeah, I made it, yes. And then you just kind of leave your buddies behind. Um, but for me, it was like, I got my foot in the door and I'm gonna bring all y'all with me if possible. <laughs> Cause everyone has something important to say and something important to share that I believe that everyone should be listening to. Um, and so going to August Wilson, Kilolo allowed me to showcase these artists that I respected and who I put in the Colored Collective. Um, and Marjani was in there, she's a, a sculptor. Um, Donald Lewis is a fashion designer. I had Campbell Jackson who I worked with at Glenstone. He's a textile artist, he collages, um, and makes these very beautiful abstract pieces with fabrics and found objects, and also from his own clothes. And I hope the wind is not too windy. Um, I put Joe in there, and I'm blanking if there was another person. But the point is, is that when I'm having these solo exhibitions, I love collaborating with artists and bringing them into that solo exhibition. And hopefully the artist talks in the future, we'll be able to like have a panel discussion um, and then also I like collaborating with artists on my physical work. And so my partner Ambrose, um, she's this amazing painter and textile artist who's also collaging the figure and taking their limbs and putting them in different, like you just gotta look her up on her Instagram. Um, but she does like a lot of the textiles on my pieces. So does Keisha Branson, shout out to y'all. Um, and as I continue to find artists in the city who I love and wanna put on, It'll just continue to, I'm just gonna have a greater network um, and y'all will see them soon in an exhibition, so. Well, we, I think that's, that's, that's great. And how do you spell your collective? C -R -D. Oh, yes, C-L-R-D. So it's colored without the vowels. You just drop the vowels. A lot of people call it cleared, but it's not cleared, y'all. It's colored, all right? So we, <laughs> for example, we have Giovanni in, in the meadows up. Yes, yes, I saw the, the pen. Who yes. did you collaborate with that? So I collaborated with Keisha Ranson. Um, she was the person who did the textiles, but also Giovanni is a, a model who I've been having more conversations with and he'll be in another painting. Um, I'm hoping to, my next objective actually, thank you Karen for uh, giving that thought to me, is to be working with photographers in Baltimore. Um, there are a lot of photographers in Baltimore who are just capturing these like authentic scenes of like what the city is, its view, its people, all these beautiful things that I want to put in my artwork. And so um, my next series is gonna include these photographers um, and then we're gonna have a conversation 
about that soon too. But yes, Giovanni would be a part of that. He's a model, but you know, his photographer is someone I'm going to be collaborating with in reference to Giovanni. Um, and yeah, so yeah, wonderful. And and uh, Ludovic, do you do you um, collaborate with others or? Uh, yeah, I actually love to collaborate uh, with artists. Uh, I kind of treated like the way musicians collaborate with each other on songs and whatnot. Uh, so I have one friend, close friend of mine, that we actually collaborate quite a few. Uh, John Rivas, which is another uh, mutual friend me and uh, Rallies have. Uh, so what John and I do is every time we hang at each other's studio, we'll create a piece together. You know, whether it be a, it's usually a small piece, not nothing too crazy. So we'll do, we always do two. Okay. In hopes that, you know, in the future, we'll have a joint show together just with, you know, uh, our collaborative pieces. So usually I'll just start a piece. I'll start with maybe a rough sketch or rough watercolor. I actually have one right here. It's funny that you yes. mentioned this question. Okay. I have one here that I'll show you guys in a second. Okay. But, um, I'll start with like uh, a few lines and some colors on top. And then John, who uh, works a lot with uh, mixed uh, media uh -huh. and a lot of collage. And John will just come in, he'll add, I don't, John might be in here listening to, if you are, was good, D. <laughs> but uh, so John will come back in with uh, pencils or fabric or whatever anything he would just come back and lay it on top and then we'll just go back and forth and then I'll keep one of the pieces and then he'll keep uh the other one and we have this one here I don't know if you guys can see that oh yeah cool so this is a watercolor and ink on and fabric on uh paper so what I did is I started with uh the drawing of the male figure and then I went in with uh the watercolor and then I laid it out, let it dry, and then John came on top, and then John started playing around with the, the colors and the fabric and the pattern and all that. And we did one two that he has, but that's his. Okay, okay. I and and yeah, that's something you guys do regularly. You guys, when you get to yeah, the whenever this piece was actually just done uh, this month. Yeah, oh. Riley's was in the studio too. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So whenever we get together, yeah. And Raelis, um, do you participate with some of this collaborative work with, with others? You gotta unmute, babe. You gotta take the mute off. My bad. Thank you. Yes, son. <laughs> um, now, when, when you said collaborative, I automatically, like I don't um, collaborate in terms of like working on one painting uh -huh. I haven't in a very long time um, working on one piece with another artist. But when you said it, I immediately thought about the way that I work with models. Yes. And who my models are. And it's usually my family. And those kind of interactions that we always have when I'm documenting them, when I'm photographing them, or when I'm sketching them. And, you know, that, that interaction usually goes with them wanting me to represent them as cute as possible. Um, and I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I'm interested in in the work. It's about vulnerability. It's, so it's, it's really interesting because it allows me to understand where they're coming from and then they also see what my practice is about. So yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest form of collaboration that I do actively since I'm always working with uh, people that I know, whether it's my family or friends. Um, so yeah. And, and Cameron? Um, I don't normally collaborate with, um, with other artists individually on like my own personal work. I have had dialogues with other painters where we'll send, um, like art back and forth or we'll go to each other's studios and like paint each other or things like this and then have discussions about artwork or whatnot. But I do think about collaboration in terms of like my use of found materials yeah. often, um, yeah. and that, you know, uh, I, scour things from all around various neighborhoods around my studio. And uh, there's always something like, like Terry Atkins would call it like potential disclosure, right? That like, there's like more than just a physical sort of 
quality to this thing, but that um, it's got like some, you know, inherent spirit to it or something. Um, like, for example, I think there's a, a slide, it's called Jazz from 2018, if you could pull that up. Um, from the PowerPoint, that would be awesome. But there's a keyboard in that work that I found on uh, the street at one point. And, you know, I've always been really frustrated with, uh, you know, conversations around painting, especially while studying in, in school, that, that if you depicted something, say like in a still life or whatever, we'd always be talking about the paint before we could have a conversation of what was being depicted. Yeah. And um, at a certain point, I was like, well, let's make that gap really minimal and started including things I would find um, all around in the work. And I found this keyboard and there's something really amazing about it. It's like clearly a child's keyboard. And the reason I knew that is because on each one of the keys, it's like they put a little sticker of which note it was. And there's yeah. just like, you know, <laughs> there's something that I could never author with my own hand that has, you know, it's this inherent history to this thing that then gets, you know, uh, sort of, elevated to something regal um and in that way there's a sort of collaborative element with that you know things i find around uh, my studio but aren't you also taking past and uh repurposing it to the to the present and oh yeah totally i mean there's uh you know and most of the things i make there's a sort of um a uh, way put on, you know, thinking about time and various histories. I'm constantly borrowing, you know, like there's CDs in this uh, painting, for example, that hold a record of, of, you know, whether it be, you know, music or a DVD or something, but it's like borrowing from, you know, like that's a very recent moment of archaic technology or borrowing from, you know, uh, like behind me, there's like, you know, an image yeah. of Lindy Kravitz shirtless in this painting. Um, and oh, so borrowing from, okay. <laughs> from like various uh, moments and thinking about appropriation this way where it's like more of a um, a collaborative moment with, uh, you know, uh, cultural signifiers. So just to, okay, let's just, so sometimes you go dumpster diving, right? Yeah, every right. once in a while I'll go like, you know, I'll go scavenge for materials out in the street or you know, they'll be in people's trash cans sticking out and I'll be like, like I found a pair of crutches I put in the painting that way or, um, you know, I've included multiple, some, surprisingly I found multiple keyboards um, while hunting around for materials, but. So, so how has that dumpster diving made you more interested in using the black figure in your work? Um, I would say that Something about, using, um, yeah. something about using found materials, it's always, you know, that's usually where a lot of the work starts is that I'll find something and then I'll be like, oh, well, I can develop a narrative around this, you know, one thing. Like I have a friend who, uh, who um, sells pianos and uh, he recently like threw out, you know, a whole 88 set of like a, you know, 100 year old piano. And then I milled all the keys down and they're actually like, oh, wow. and sort of like, um, a way to sort of talk about the potential for, you know, um, narrative in a more abstract way. Um, like in some, in the work I just showed on the, the PowerPoint, it's thinking about, you know, oh, I can tell a story, um, you know, people of color are included in that narrative. And I think like you walk around, I spend a lot of time in Europe or you walk around in various museums and you see, you know, mosaics and, and people of color aren't ever depicted in that medium. I became fascinated with like making that for, um, for you know, black people and thinking about the potential, the stories I could tell. You know, you can take um, like, I've made work about various mythologies and, you know, in a similar way that Cole Scott might've been working, like interjecting blackness into these sort of, what are predominantly white narratives throughout um, both art and, you know, cultural history. So I would say that something really like the found element sort of sp springs a potential for a narrative. Right. Now, Ludovic, thank you, Cameron. Ludovic, yeah. you um, um, oftentimes, you know, work with masks and um, objects as well. How do you uh, intertwine that into your practice? 
you got to undo the mute. The mute. I'm, yeah, I'm going to do that all the time just to warn you guys. Uh, <laughs> I would say with the mask that I'm making, the way that they intertwine is they're directly related to the people that I'm painting in these uh, paintings that I'm making. Um, so a lot of the time I paint people from my tribe or my father's tribe or whosoever tribe. And then each tribe in Cameroon uh, have a mask that they're represented uh, by or known for. Like in Cameroon, uh, we have this tribe called the Bamileke tribe. They have uh, a mask. It's all, it almost serves like a mascot okay. in a weird way. So they have this mask called uh, the elephant mask. So it's kind of shaped like the elephant is because they believe the elephant is this big um, shrine that they uh, look up to for knowledge and all that stuff. So, and also with these masks, I'm regaining uh, the power that these masks have culturally back home because some of these masks are made for uh, specific ceremonies and celebrations. But at times here and in a lot of uh, countries, these masks are just being appropriated in a lot of these big stores like uh, Walmart, Ikea, and all that. So with the mask, just like the figures in my paintings, is this sense that they've been alienated from their actual reality. Yes, this mask, for example, yeah. And in each mask that I make, they're all named um, after a number. Yes. Because in a lot of these uh, stores too, whenever these masks go from, uh, let's say home Africa to another country, they become just an object to them. And they're going to this inventory sheet as a number. So for say, let's say a store like uh, Ikea would put this in the inventory as item number four. So each painting uh, that has a mask on from me always go by uh, that naming system as well. And, and while we're talking about that a little bit, um, could you go into the medium here that you have with item number four? Yeah, uh, so this is all um, acrylic and sand on a uh, canvas, but the sand has been treated in a way that is binding with, uh, I'm not on mute, right? Just making sure, okay. <laughs> that has been, because I'll see you. So it's been, Bind it with the paint and actually allows it to stick to the canvas with some uh, chemicals that I use. And then the bottom part is uh, acrylic, the wood grain. Mm -hmm. And that's um, a representation of what these masks are usually made from back home. They're usually carved from special or sacred trees that, you know, some trees could be looked at for healing. So we'll make a mask that symbolize healing or health out of that specific tree. So a lot of the times when I'm painting these uh, stripes of uh, wood in these paintings, it's a note to, you know, these things that we get from uh, trees or just nature around us in Africa, because uh, we're always around nature and these things. And this is just part of the culture there. And just expanding on that first for a moment about the wood and it's, and, um, can you just talk about maybe one or two of those woods, the that might yeah yeah so for let me give you another uh quick story so whenever i grew up in cameroon we lived in this house that was just made out of wood and uh mud so this is almost me rebuilding this house in each of these paintings because the materials that i'm using on this are the same exact materials that were used in building this home that i grew up in but it was just very very cheap so uh, instead of sand, we used mud, and that was used to uh, bring the wood and um, just the structure together. Okay. So this is also me trying to find this idea of home, because mm -hmm. like, you know, I moved from Cameroon to uh, the United States, and like, or at least as well, I didn't know the language, I didn't know the culture, and all of that was just a lot of feelings of alienation. And I find myself a lot of the time trying to find a home or the idea of where do I fit in. So I thought to myself, why not just build this home that we've been looking for out of these materials that were used 
to build the house that I grew up in. I, I yeah. think that's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that because the sand, um, you know, gives it that texture. And yeah, the, yeah, for these, you really, yeah, you have to see these. Right, right. But um, I, I think that's right. And Raylis, tell us a little bit about, about your process and your practice. Um, can, can we bring up an image uh, of Raylis so we can tell us a little bit about your, what you're doing with, within your work? Yeah, definitely. All right, so this painting came about, I had been working with this image and this is usually how my works happen. Like they take a lot of time before I even start working on the canvas. And I had made a few sketches of this uh, particular image, which is based on the old family photo um, before we came to the US. Um, so I was probably like six or seven um, in this image. And that's me, the, the young boy in the yellow. Um, so I was working with this image for like a year doing a lot of sketches. And yeah, a year later, and that's when I felt like I had the tools to actually make the painting uh, come to life. And this, I, when I approached this painting, I really wanted to experiment with different mediums. Mm -hmm. um, not that I feel like I I mean, I definitely took it far for my comfort, but I don't feel like I, I took it as far as um, perhaps another artist would. But I feel like, you know, all these different elements, the way that I painted each individual figure, none of them are really painted um, the same or drawn the same. Some of them are done in ink, some of them in oil, some acrylic, some charcoal, some graphite. Um, and I use these transfers on, which is, you know, basically that wall in the back of like old family photos and also photos that I thought meant something um, to my family's narrative and the history of the Dominican Republic as well. And in particular, I wanted to point out that one, um, the biblical image. Yes. That in, Madonna child. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, with the white Jesus. Um, yeah, th that biblical image at the top, uh, right? is the same like image that you see in this uh, painting back here. So I've like gone back to it a lot. And this specific image is one that's in my grandma's home. So every time we go and I visit my grandmother, she has this image up. And I, I always think about like the role of religion and how it's affected, um, you know, everyone, specifically like my family in the Dominican Republic, um, how we see ourselves through religion and things like that. And underneath that image is, Rafael Trujillo, who was a dictator of the Dominican Republic, um, probably, I don't know, from what I've read, the cruelest dictator of like this side of the, uh, the planet. And yeah, the image right next to him, that transfer is my grandfather when he was uh, just starting in the military. And I found something out, which was really interesting while I was talking to my grandmother about like that time when Trujillo was in power. And is that my grandfather, uh, Trujillo was killed in 1961, and my grandfather enlisted in the army in 1960. So it was like, you know, that was really a, a shocker for me to find that out. And then it led me to investigate even, even deeper. Um, and that the image above that is my grandparents. But then what you have going on in the background, uh, outside of where the people are, is sugarcane, uh, like a sugarcane field. And I really wanted to, you know, I had been studying about all these different things about the history of the Dominican Republic and the importance of produce, the importance of labor, how much sugar comes out of the Dominican Republic, how much I personally love sugar canes. Um, and I'm <laughs> super excited anytime that I am able to eat some. So I, you know, I, I really wanted to play with all these elements in this one painting. Um, and it's called Si Dios Quiere, which is God willing. And it's something that, you know, my family says all the time. Like, if I say, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow, they'll be like, si Dios quiere. Like, they'll, they'll always remind me that it's like, you know, it's not completely up to you. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I think that's great that you're discussing spirituality because spirituality is something in the art world that is skirted over. It. Yeah, people don't really like you. Know, it's, it's something that you don't often hear people speak about uh, within the art world. So thank you very much for sharing that. And thank you for uh, 
explaining this piece because of the mixed media element of it. It's just really much more complex. And that brings us, thank you to Miss, or to, um, to um, Amani, who went into their studio uh, or something. It got on. hot. It got really hot. I just moved into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, Felt. do you mind? Do you mind I, I know you've got that summer heat too out there. <laughs> Yes, we do. It's, it's humidity. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of trifling, but I'm dealing with it. It's fine. <laughs> okay, you did fine. Thank you for coming. <laughs> that just opened the door to us to talk about the piece behind you. Yes, you okay. About your practice and your what's happening with you, with your process right now? Um, sure. How do I, how do I turn this? I'm so old. How do I turn this around? I'll just show you all really quickly what it is. Hi, Ambrose. Okay, so... Um, this is a piece I'm currently working on. It's called Zay. Um, yeah, I'll close up real quick. For those who kind of know my practice, this is just another very colorful one. Um, turn it back around on me. So I already talked about the collaborative effort, and I treat each piece as that. Um, the people who are in the pieces are there's like an attention to that. I just don't choose a random subject. It's like someone I am, you know, engaging with or getting to know very closely or someone I admire, someone I see in the city who's doing their thing, things like that. People I want to help. A lot of uh, what I'm trying to do is bring like, the first step at least for me is to bring some finances into folks' lives and some exposure. And so along with that collaboration, the people I collaborate with, whether it's the model, the photographer, or the artists are receiving part of the proceeds as well. So it's not like I'm selling pieces and then I pocket all of it. It's part of my proceeds go to each one of those people. Um, and so, That's one thank of the you. things that impressed me when I first met you, is how you're spreading it out, spreading the love financially. Yes, thank you. It's like bringing these resources that I'm garnering as an artist from outside and then bringing them right back to the city. Like that's, the main goal for me and then eventually when I get a bigger name and I'm able to like host things in the city hopefully that will bring even more finances or the financial aspect of my process or my practice um, to my subjects so yes yes much love to Fountainhead and Catherine actually the piece behind me is a piece of someone I met on the streets um, he was riding his bicycle and it was <laughs> he's like this grown man and he was so cute. He was wearing the dopest outfit. And I was just walking and he said hi. And I was like, hi, can I talk to you for a second? And we just kind of like sat down and talked for a hot minute. And then he took me to his house. And I swear to God, I think he was a blood because all of his family members were wearing red and black. <laughs> and <laughs> I was wearing the wrong color. I was like, do I need to go home and change before we sit down and talk? <laughs> I was like... <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but long story short, I found out that they're all very creative. Uh, one of his like younger sons is a poet, so he was like telling me that he had all these writings and he wanted to feature me in one of his podcasts. And I was like, yeah. And then I met um, his sister. Her name was Magic. Unfortunately, I had to leave Fountainhead, so I wasn't able to produce this and those pieces in Fountainhead, but I do plan on going back to Miami to get back in touch with that family, make these works, sell the works, and then bring them some money. Because I know they talked about that as a, an issue. Um, but what do I do? What was the question? Was it about materials? Because that's what everyone's been talking about. Your process. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it starts off with the photograph. And again, the subject, there's intentions with that. Um, I'll take the photograph that I either took or am using from a photographer and I'll put it on Photoshop and I'll get rid of the skin. So okay. something I like to do on the photograph is to draw these one line drawings to represent the figure. Um, and I started this in 2015 for the Freddie Gray protesting mm -hmm. um, just because I didn't want, I talk about this a lot, so I'll get it right. But during the protests, I didn't want to be that one person who was like taking videos and photographs mm -hmm. and posting it on social media. Like for me, it was like, this is a historic moment in Baltimore mm -hmm. and shit's burning up. People are shouting, throwing rocks. It was just crazy. And I was like, let me just do like these one line drawings to represent what I was seeing. And so 
I started like quickly jotting down the people and the figure. And I wish I gave you some sketches because they would be nice to put up right now. I don't have them on me. Um, but they're just these beautiful one line drawings. And then in 2017 or 18, I revisited those drawings and I was like, oh, there's something very interesting about that. And so I started thinking about Baltimore and its landscapes and how the city doesn't have a lot of like these natural landscapes. And <laughs> my partner, at the time, my partner had me flying on the plane a lot. <laughs> and so I was looking out the window of the plane and seeing how the, the ground was like mapped out. Like if you're looking at the mountains or the hills or the meadows or cities, it's like a mapping that happens. Mm -hmm. And I started like associating that one line drawing to a mapping of the figure's um, lineage or their facial structures and where that comes from and started thinking about how people even like migrated to Baltimore from jump. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was really bad at color theory in school. Um, my teachers used to tell me that. And so a practice for me was like, getting the colors right. So all of my pieces are very vibrant, um, not because I'm self-conscious about the critiques I was getting from school, but mainly because in Baltimore, a lot of people's critiques is that it's very dull and there's like boarded up homes and it's raggedy and there's like, there's just like all these negative connotations that are associated to the city. And so like, for me, I don't see that at all. I mean, yes, all these things are factual. There are boarded up homes, there are homeless people. These are all problems that needs to be dealt with on like, of governing and political standpoint, because obviously that needs to be fixed. But when you're living in the city and you are walking on the sidewalks or in the streets yeah. and you see how people are engaging with their city, people who have been there for like their entire lives, there's like a different vision that you have. And so for me, it's like, I see the saturation of the city that most people don't see. And I see the saturation of these beautiful colors within the models. And so like pieces like this, become very yeah, vibrant yeah yeah they're just very vibrant and very like I say authentic to their characters and again that's something I'm going to keep going back to because it's important that we know that I don't know we're just not people who are wearing traumas on our sleeves I mean yes we've gotten the shitty hand but we are strong people we've been getting through a lot of these things in our lives um and like I know for one I have I've seen myself be the strongest right now in 2020 than I've ever knew I had the strength to like hold on to anything. It's just been left and right and it's been testing me, but it's nice to like feel that strength within yourself and to see the strength within my subjects. So it deserves yeah. to be represented correctly. You capture the strength within your subjects uh, very, very mm. well. And, and Thank you. You know, you're a very strong person. And I always say from a religious standpoint, Lord, mm -hmm. of as much as we can handle exactly and, come on now strong shoulders my dear because <laughs> mm -hmm. it, um that's what i've been told and um we as a people have to be very strong because we have to persevere more so than some others so yes uh, it's, just, it's just something i think that is ingrained in that parents sometimes just raise our children a certain way mm -hmm. uh, and and this and so um our thoughts, our prayers are with you, Amani. Thank you. This Thank very you. Very difficult time, and we hope that Trey uh, improves and gets better, and that you uh, continue to be strong and uphold your your mother and your siblings. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah. Um, we did get an update today, and neurologically, he's doing wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't know, my brother Tejan, he. Um, got in a motorbike accident and he ended up uh, in ICU and shit was not looking good for a very long time. But today um, we, got, we got good news that he's like responding the way the nurses and doctors want him to be responding. He's smiling, he's doing thumbs up. Oh, he's great. like, he's conscious. And I think oh, that's good. for me the most important thing that Tejan is still in there. Cause at first it was kind of like, the human body, they're trying to get the body to react, but it's now my brother reacting to these things. So it's awesome. That's wonderful. That's yeah. great. Great. Um, so Ludovic, I and, and Cameron and uh, Raylis, I just uh, want to ask you guys, is there something you'd like to say 
uh, before we, we close out here today. Um, you all are wonder doing wonderful things and um, you know, it's great to have the four of you together at this time in, in your careers in, in June of 2020. Is, do you, do you all have do you, individually? Do you have anything to say? Um, I mean, I want to start by saying thank you to you and uh, your gallery for giving us this yes. platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, especially during these times, you know, a lot of people have so much more to worry about uh, than putting things shows like this together. So thank you, and also thank you to everyone that tuned in just to listen to us and. Yeah, just thankful, that's all. Yeah, I, I second that. Very thankful to you, Karen, for multiple things. And in speaking about engagement and like how you relate to your subjects or to your friends, your pals, your peers, whoever. Um, I think just our relationship on a personal and professional level, I've just been very grateful of. And so... Thank you for always uh, putting us on, creating these platforms. <laughs> and I'm praying and hoping everyone in their personal lives are healthy and feeling good. The days have been wonderful these past couple of days. And so I hope y'all are taking in that sun as much as you can. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, I, I also wanted to say thank you for, you know, giving us a platform and giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. I think it's uh, really important. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I think during these times, I think, you know, we aren't really sure how much longer we're going to be in this state. Um, but you know, we just got to keep moving forward. Um, so yeah, yeah. yes, sir. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. There's a question from Danny B in here to Ludovic and Raylas. He says, Ooh. what medium besides painting are you developing at the moment, if any? Danny, uh, I'm I'm kidding. Uh, I'm actually working on some sound work and um, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm working on some sound work and a few things that uh, could be seen as a little more sculptural and installation wise. It's still everything is still in the process of coming together. So I can't talk much on it. But we're branching out. That's all I can say. Yes. And, and I'm Dan, coming with you. <laughs> Dan, he, asked, <laughs> he asked to Cameron and Monty, when are you both collaborating? I Cameron, want to let's that. go. <laughs> go, Cameron. <laughs> so, um, are you in New York? Where are you? Yeah, I'm in Bedside. Oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can come to me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> guys, joking. I would love to see that. We're so excited to have you guys in our figurative summer exhibition. It's our first virtual exhibition, and um, just so the audience knows that it's it's an exhibition that has a spotlight artist. Uh, and right now, the spotlight artist is Ludovic. And, bow, bow, bow. Yes, and. Um, um, What's that pose you did in that picture? Oh. <laughs> he thinks he's so fly. That. That was We're so fly. That. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Y'all not going to get on me like that. No. <laughs> oh, my God. So Luna picks the spot, first, first spotlight, and then we go to Cameron, and then we go to Rayless, and then uh, Amani will be winding us up. So... Everybody stay tuned and look out for that in the coming weeks. And y'all be safe and well. And yes. take time to, um, to enjoy the summer. And, Thank and you. Also, shout out, sorry, shout out to Rachel in the back, too. Oh, I yeah. know no one can see her, but she's <laughs> keeping all this thing together. So thank you, Rachel. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a good day. You too. <laughs>